Back in 2010, Remedy released Alan Wake and they wanted to make a sequel. A sequel that would have live action elements, but Microsoft said, no, we must diversify our games lineup. Not in terms of race or sexuality, that I actually agree with, but rather in terms of content. And so they started development on Quantum Break, a game that is, spoiler alert, not very good at all. So what even is Quantum Break? Quantum Break's premise is fairly subdued for a game largely about time travel and the end of the world. In the city of Riverport, Paul Serene, played by Littlefinger, the sex pervert from Game of Thrones, creates a time machine of that hobbit from Lord of the Rings and decides to use it with the help of his long-lost friend Jack Joyce, or Iceman. But due to a miscalculation on Serene's part, it all goes horribly wrong, sending Serene into the past and also causing time to break down, putting the entire world firmly onto the road to destruction. But on a more positive note, you get time powers, as does Serene, who is now stuck in the past and infused with like a really high concentration of time travel particles can see into the future. So he begins to plan and figure out how to save the world. Or does he? You've just got to keep watching to figure that part out. Let's jump to the presentation now. First up, visuals. So in a general sense, the game looks good, but that has a massive asterisk attached to it. It looks good if you squint your eyes because the details are a little fucked, or in actuality, a little fuzzy because this game is blurry as fuck. And this isn't really a setting you can change because it seems to be part of the game. There's no way to fix it, but you can kind of alleviate it somewhat. Because Remedy in all their infinite wisdom has forced something called temporal reconstruction. And in a nutshell, this game is rendered at 720p with 4 times MSAA, and then upscaled 1080p using that 720p image. This made it far easier to run on consoles, but on PC, that doesn't really matter because the game, even now six years on, runs like shit and looks terrible half the time. But, and this is a pretty big but, there's a setting in the display subsetting menu called upscaling. And when this is off, the game runs like an even bigger piece of shit, but it looks a bit better. So it's really up to you. I don't think it makes much of a difference having it on or off in terms of fidelity but it makes a big difference in terms of performance. It can go from unplayable to playable, just a bit blurrier. This was an issue with control as well, so it's probably just an engine quirk, if anything. But other than the blurriness, this game looks pretty good. There are moments where I went, wow. As in typical Remedy fashion, this game is very creative with its effects. The game is about time travel, so there's a lot of wacky set pieces that look great, but the thing is, they are purely visual and graphical wow moments, and that's a good thing, don't get me wrong, but my, my point is, there's not much to talk about, they just look good. And that's kind of like a general statement for the entire game. It all looks good, sure, it's a bit blurry at times, and it seems to also depend on the level as well, as the first level is for sure the worst offender in that regard. And I don't know if this is unique to me or not, but it seemed to get better as the game went along. One thing I will say is I really like this game's commitment to real spaces. Like everywhere you go in this game with a few exceptions is really grounded in reality, which helps to separate the more science fiction elements from the drama of the narrative. But in saying that, Quantum Break does suffer from the uninspired enemy design so common in shooters during the mid 2010s. And I do believe this is because they wanted the game to feel more grounded, but it means that all enemies look the same. The game even has two types of heavy enemies that look pretty much identical, but the way you deal with them is slightly different. But again, they just look like generic super tough tank enemies that every single third person shooter set in the modern day has. It's uninspired is kind of the best way to describe the game's visuals. It's missing Remedy's trademark style. It feels like a Microsoft first party game, not a Remedy game. A bigger issue for me, however, is character models and their animations. Why? Well, this is a narrative-driven game. We watch a lot of cutscenes and listen to a lot of dialogue. Let's use an example from the first level, literally about 30 or so seconds in. This is Jack, our protagonist, talking to another character in the game. I don't know 
if everyone's in agreement with me here, but I think this looks terrible. The way that it violently shifts between animation sets is so fucking funny. Plus his idle animation is just him looking really scared. I don't really understand what the plan was here. Is the player not meant to look at the people talking? Or are we meant to be distracted by the pretty lights? I don't know, but that's how every conversation looks. The in-engine ones aren't much better either, which is strange, because surely more care would be given to them, but nah, not really. So overall, visuals are fine, they seem lacking in style and in polish. Let's shift gears to audio before we dive in at the deep end for gameplay. This game sounds pretty okay. There's not really much to say here to be perfectly honest. The vocal performances are good. My visions of the future aren't always clear, but they don't lie. Speaking of lies, Joyce is saying he's discovered his brother's time machine. We've spent 17 years looking for it and he finds it in less than a day. It's like you invented a clock. Yes, years ahead of our time. I need to know we're still in this together. I told you once our fate is already laid out for us. I still believe that. More than ever. I'm just worried what that might mean. Some lines don't really read the best. Oh. Don't. Don't. But this is a very very ambitious narrative and they heavily relied on star power to get people interested in the game. So some of the actors perhaps shouldn't have been chosen because they don't really understand how to voice act. Like they're good in the TV show segments, so it's kind of complicated to talk about. I mean, for example, Sean Ashmore, our protagonist, is great in the live action stuff, but his performance is not, in my opinion anyway, all that good in the in-game cutscenes or really in gameplay. And that kind of holds true for everyone. So maybe it's less of a reflection on the cast skill and more of a reflection on the process of VO work and how it's a very different type of work to traditional on-screen and on-set acting. The rest of the game's soundscape, however, is gunfire and time effects. And I mean, I don't know, they, they sound fine. I thought the gunfire was lacking in impact and it sounds kind of like it was just pulled from a library. But the time effects? They're cool, I like them. I don't know enough about sound design or engineering to really appreciate what Remedy did, so I'll leave it at, it all sounds good. And I want to preface the gameplay section with this. I have been pretty negative thus far, but I hope it comes across as appreciative, not degrading or, you know, free of context. I have played every Remedy game minus that one racing game they made, so I know what I like from them, I know what sets them apart from other third-person shooter developers. And whatever Quantum Break is, it's not that. At least in gameplay. The narrative is a whole other thing. And with that, gameplay. Quantum Break is a third-person shooter with cover mechanics, but it's not a cover-based shooter. It definitely looks like one, but it's poised through other mechanics to not be. The cover is just in case things get hairy and you need to regenerate your health or wait for a cooldown. Because yes, time powers. That is the game's main selling feature, and I finished the game a week ago and I, I still don't know if I like them. I think the idea is cool, but when I think of time powers, I don't think of shields or a, a dodge. I think of aging my enemies to dust so they die in front of me. Or turning an enemy cover into dust so I can shoot at them. I think of using, like age as a weapon, I guess, not slowing down or fast forwarding time. And that's what Quantum Break's abilities are. So let's run through them. First off, we have a dash. It's a way to close the distance and it's it's what it says in the, the, the tin. But if you dash an enemy though, you send them flying in slow motion, letting you meal oh wait. There is no me meal out. Let's hip fight. Oh wow. There's no hip fight. You have to ADS to shoot your gun. Which means that this dash attack thing is really strange from a gameplay flow point of view. This is something that I have bolded and capitalized in my script, so it obviously means a lot to me that I make this a really big point. This is a third-person shooter with a focus on movement 
and we can't even hip fire. Even though we have abilities that seemingly scream out for the ability to hip fire. One of our abilities is the power to stop time to localize fear. This means that enemies can't move or attack and any bullets you fire at them get instantly applied once the, the effect times out. This means that you could insta-kill a heavy if you unload onto them. It's cool, it looks good, can't really complain. We have Time Shield, which is the same as Time Stop, but it's a sphere that gets placed at our feet. It stops bullets, again it's fine, but I feel like you don't need a Time Stop sphere and a Shield sphere because they do the same thing. It feels redundant to me, but okay. We have Time Blast, which is like an area of effect attack that normally kills most enemies who've charged up. Again, it's cool, we can knock out a lot of enemies who've charged up, but we already have three area of effect attacks that can all be used to do the same thing. It's redundancy, right? The last proper ability is Time Rush, which lets you charge an enemy and punch them. This is technically a melee attack, but it's an ability, not just an attack that we have. I don't really like this one because of that. It's taking a normal mechanic and making it harder and more situational to use. I'm not really a fan. The last ability, if you can even call it that, is Time Vision. This is effectively like the collectible vision mode that every game has these days. It lets you see where the upgrade points are, but you don't need to worry about them. You don't need them as the abilities are already way too powerful. And the upgrades are nice, sure, but not really needed because you have to go out of your way to get them. Because the time vision thing makes no fucking sense to me. But upgrades are nice, so, you know, do it if you want to. So as you can see, the powers are kind of all over the place. They're fun to use and they look nice, but the gameplay application of them is kind of weak in my opinion. They are the most surface level ideas when it comes to using time travel and time manipulation in combat. But because this is the game we have, I will say they don't suck as much as I made them out to be. The game is fun, like it's really fun at times, but it's frustrating as well because it was so close to being a much better game. One such thing you notice towards the end of the game is that you don't really need to use your abilities all if you just take cover every now and then. The abilities are basically just for creating pauses in combat so you can heal. Sure, some do direct damage, but so does a bullet to the head. They also have this strange latency between uses. Not of the same power, but any power. This is not a cooldown, what I'm talking about. You will use like your time blast and your time shield, and you won't be able to use them immediately after each other because there's like a weird latency in like the input being recognized, I guess. Like I had instances where I dashed but then couldn't use another power, but I sure as hell could shoot. Which brings me to my next big problem with gameplay. The game is the same start to finish. There's no real switch up in gameplay. There's no mechanics that you have to learn. The first combat encounter is the same as the last. There's some additions, sure, like soldiers that also have time powers, they can dash, and that's really it. But the thing is, you deal with them the same way, you just shoot them. There's heavies, which sure, can punish you for being out in the open, but you deal with them the same way. You shoot them. This isn't as grievously terrible as the game is only 4-5 to five hours long, like an actual gameplay. And that's excluding the surgically attached television series. There's some puzzles around the place as well, but they're all identical, so yeah. The gameplay is a little stale, a little basic, a little bland, but it doesn't fall apart like so many other games combat systems do. It falls apart when scrutinized in a review, but in function and execution, it's fun. It doesn't overstay its welcome, but it is stale after the first few hours. What about the narrative, though? Jack Joyce. In the flesh. The esteemed Mr. Paul Serene. Shaking money bags. Well, it's time travel, so buckle up because there's a lot of talk about from the narrative itself all the way to the mechanics of its time travel and the fact that the game actually has two main narratives which are both exclusive to a point. So yeah, okay, let's start. The game starts in the year 2016 with its protagonist Sean Ashmore or Jack Joyce. We then meet up with his old friend Paul Serene who works on time travel. He also worked with your brother William, who they had like basically spent the better part of their lives working on time travel. 
To skip ahead, time travel works, the machine works. It uses these chronon particles, which are basically this game's catch-all for time energy or magic or whatever. This is all well and good, but then Will shows up with a gun and says that time will break if they do anything. The machine overloads and fills everyone in the room with chronon particles, save Will. What this means is that Serene and Jack have magical powers and everything is frozen in time, at least for a little while, before time starts to ba like, catch up. We discovered that during these stutters, we can like allow someone to move by touching them. We escape from the Monarch private military and then we stumble upon Paul again, but not the same Paul we know. It's Paul from the past, but also the future because this is the Paul we sent through who got sent to the end of time who then took the time machine back, like, I think it's like something like 20 years before the game starts, and, that, and then he built up Monarch, basically. And the whole thing is, Paul doesn't believe that time can be fixed. He thinks that time's gonna end, and we just have to deal with it. Something which Will, our brother, goes, no, it's not true, I can fix it. Will is then killed by Paul as he explodes the building, crushing Will under the rubble. That's the game's first level, it's the setup. It's a it's a decent enough setup. It really made me invested in the world and its characters. I actually kinda like Paul Serene's sudden turn to evil. Not only is it is it sudden, it's technically within the narrative been in the making for multiple decades as he plans on how to save the world from the end of time. Whatever the end of time actually is. However, the intro isn't done. We have to make a decision. A decision for Paul. Do we let the witnesses go and have them spread whatever information they want, or do we control the narrative and paint Jack Joyce, our protagonist, as a terrorist? The decision does make some differences for the narrative. Like, for reference, I chose to control the narrative, and Amy, the student here, became a fairly major side character for a few moments during the game. We even get, like, telltale S stats on what players chose. Cool. And then we cut to the TV show, and as you can imagine, covering this narrative is going to be a little weird. We have choices that actually affect the narrative. We have a TV show thrown in that also changes based on the choices you make. It's a lot. So I think in order to make this part of the video more digestible, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the broader strokes of the narrative. There will be things that don't change or remain very similar across the different choices. So I think we should now have a look at the live action show in an overall sense. Talk about it in general, basically review it. And then we can return to the narrative as presented in the combined product, if that makes sense. Yeah, this video is a bit fucky. We'll just roll with it. The live action show is made up of four episodes of about 22 or so minutes. It's standard like daytime television length. 22 minutes of ads brings it up to about 30. There's no ads, thankfully, here, so we're good on that front. The show is honestly pretty okay. It's shot like a medium budget limited series. It's got stunts, explosions, visual effects. Decent script fronted by some pretty decent actors. Lance Riddick, as always, steals the scenes he's in. Aiden Gillian is great. Sean Ashmore is great. Courtney Hope is amazing. Dominic Monaghan is okay. Patrick Hausener is also awesome. And you might notice that some of these people aren't actually in the game. Because the show focuses on sort of like a B-plot with a B-cast of characters. I'm calling them B-cast and B-characters because it's a second plot and a second cast of characters. Not because they are worse or really all that different. The plot within the show focuses much more on the people involved and the politics and science of the entire time travel thing. While the game focuses on set pieces and gameplay. Narrative takes a big step back for the majority of the game, but is the focus of the TV show. That's ultimately the main difference between the two. I would say that if you want a well-written time travel story, the show is the infinitely better option of the two. 
It explores a lot of cool ideas and really works as a tie-in for the game as we get to see the wider ramifications of the events within the game. And that's cool as the TV show apparently has 40 variations that you can see if you do certain things in the game. Apparently you can erase a whiteboard and the whiteboard is like clear in the show. I don't know how many vari like variations are like that and how many are actually big meaningful ones. I imagine that each choice you make at the end of the chapter counts as one, so there's at least a few here and there. But that's cool, nonetheless. Let's talk about the narrative overall now. The mixture of live action and in-engine like cutscenes and gameplay for delivering a narrative is a very interesting idea and I think it kinda worked. There's some weirdness in how the two cross over. Like some characters are tiny in the game but are central to the show's narrative. Some characters are present in both but only really make sense if you engage with both. Which is a problem considering that the video files for the show are not local to your computer. They are streamed and they are streamed in 4K regardless of your computer's resolution. This is a problem for me as it meant that my shitty Australian internet was like constantly buffering it. So I ended up just watching it on YouTube but I didn't watch them as I played the game, I watched them after. Which really made me realise just how like truncated the two narratives are. But also how essential they are to the overall experience. You could easily just play the game and never watch the show. I don't think you would have a terrible experience but you'd be left asking a lot of questions that would be answered if you didn't skip over the TV show. So it's kind of weird. It's awkward. You play an hour of the game and then you have to sit through like half an hour of live action drama. It's a really awkward way to do it. But does it work? Kinda? I always felt a little annoyed when I would have to play the game to record it and then I would just have to sit there watching drama that I wasn't really interested in. Because I was just there to shoot bad guys. It's kind of like the equivalence of an unskippable cutscene. And this is where I would kind of go like plot point by plot point, tell you about the whole narrative and all the twists and turns, but I don't think I'll be doing that here. This game is almost entirely driven by its plot. Instead, I'm just going to tell you that I liked it overall. Characters are good, acting's good, writing's good. It's Remedy. It's good. But I will say that the game has their worst writing by far. Of the exclusion of that racing game, because I can imagine that only has terrible writing. But regardless, it's better than your average shooter. But it's not Remedy. Let me explain. Quantum Break, as previously mentioned, is the joint work of two companies, Microsoft and Remedy. And as stated in the intro, Quantum Break was originally going to be Alan Wake 2, but Microsoft said no. So this is not the game that Remedy set out to make, but rather what they were told to make. I don't want you to get the wrong impression here. Remedy weren't held at gunpoint, but they definitely didn't have the control one would expect. A single player narrative heavy game, especially one about time travel, is a very hard pill to swallow for pretty much everyone. Even harder when the game is meant to be a big push for your new console, so Microsoft had to play it carefully and I imagine that part of that was Remedy being told to pull back some of their unique style, so they could make a more universally viable game for a console market. This has since been confirmed by Control's game director in an interview of Eurogamer. With Quantum Break, we talked about wanting to, for lack of a better word, be mainstream. We carefully chose things and sometimes even avoided certain things we love. We were too anxious about being too weird. We played it safe with Quantum Break in many ways. And I guess, if anything, that's my biggest problem with Quantum Break. It's perhaps one of the safest games I've ever played. Not a single combat encounter, narrative beat, or random email made my jaw drop. Nothing is unique in Quantum Break. Apart from its premise, and even that is clearly inspired by other media, something that I normally wouldn't fault Remedy for. I mean, Alan Wake takes a lot of its charm from Twin Peaks, a series I absolutely adore, and the thing is that's fine because Alan Wake also has solid gameplay, music, and atmosphere, something that Quantum Break simply doesn't. Quantum Break's you know, influences kind of stem from Primer, especially in terms of its time travel mechanics. You can only time travel back as long as the, the machine to do it is in the past or in the future you are planning to travel to, and the machine has to be on. This makes sense, it also works to constrict the plot from going too far into the future or past. But it also means that, in terms of the creativity of the team, also has to be constrained within the modern day. Which means we don't get to see any of the more visually interesting enemy design. There's even a section where we get to see a distinct, unique enemy born from the time travel medium, only to not fight it. It's disappointing, 
But seeing as this game was meant to spawn a sequel, I understand why they did it. I just don't agree with it. Same with the narration present in game, it lacks the prose flair of previous titles and is simply too careful. Much like everything else present in the game. This is what you need to know. Time broke. A growing fracture leading to the end of time. We went after a device that could fix it. Things turned ugly. Pulse Ream was there to stop us. He has superpowers. Jack. Him and me both. We failed. Jack. And of course, time travel was involved. Jack. Going too fast for you? I guess if I was to sum it up, the game has the technical know-how of a studio that has produced some of the most critically acclaimed games there is, but it lacks their creativity. Something that I would argue is far more important to their game's success. You don't remember Max Payne for its ahead of the time texture quality or its great use of the lighting. You remember it for its graphic novel presentation and its lead character. Alan Wake is a similar story. You don't remember its use of lighting or effects. But you do remember its characters, the narration, and the writing. It's not a lake. It's an ocean. But what will be remembered of Quantum Break in a decade? Will it be remembered for its graphics? I doubt it. It was cutting edge, sure, but every game looked this good a year or so later. So will it be remembered for its narrative? Yes. But not in the way Remedy hoped. It'll be remembered for being an experiment in combining live-action drama with an action game. Something that's follow-up control would do much better. So no, it won't be remembered, and perhaps that's for the best.